game was really good. My knee was bothering me, so Coach put pressure on me to keep going, and I think you would have enjoyed it. Should I even ask who won? Ha ha. Grab us some plates, please, Cam. Off the phone, Rosie. It's time to eat. It's Grandpa, see? Hey, honey. Oh, hey, Dad. How you doing? Oh, I can't complain. Don't know what would listen if I did. <laughs> put him on the screen so we can all talk to him. And where's your dad? Uh, he said he had something up in his office. He asked if you could put something in the uh, microwave for him. What am I looking at? To? Just a second, Grandpa. Yeah, hey, Rosie was telling me uh, she won her game yesterday. I scored five three-pointers. <laughs> well, there he is. My man. Well, how did your game go today, Cam? <sighs> we lost. Hey, there's no reason to be so down in the mouth about it. Nobody wins all the time, son. But it's not fair. We would have won if Jimmy Fitz had been there. Who? Jimmy Fitz, he's a best player. His mom got into an accident today on the way to the game. Oh, no, everybody's OK, but Jimmy missed the game. And we lost. Ain't no reason getting angry about it now. Accidents happen. That's part of life. But it's not fair. Tell them what happened, Mom. Mrs. Fitz apparently fell asleep while driving this morning. During the day? Was she drunk? I thought she was on something called Xanax. Xanax. Yeah, that. They said it was a drug that makes you sleepy. They? Who is they? The kids on my team. They said she went to jail, too. I hope they never let her out. Well, that's not nice, Cam. She's got a problem. Wait, what kind of problem does she have that makes her take sleeping pills during the day? No, I don't know the woman. But I imagine she, like so many others, started taking them to calm down, lessen her anxiety or whatever, and she became addicted. Truth of it is, she became physically and emotionally dependent upon those pills. Has to have them. Has to. Or rather, she thinks she does. Hmm? Do you understand, Cam? Like a crackhead. Rosie, I do not like name calling. But why would she want to be like that? I don't think she wants to be that way. But it's not always a choice. It can be pretty complicated. She can't help herself, Cam. She has a problem. A serious problem. But what is her problem? Well, it's, it, it's hard to say, Cam. I think some people are just born that way while others aren't. I know a lot of people my age that are addicted on pain meds. Man, I ate them like candy before my hip replacement surgery. But afterwards, <laughs> I couldn't wait to get off of them. It made me feel like a zombie. No good. But why would Jimmy's mom want to feel like a zombie? I wish I could tell you that. I, I never cared for pills, but when I was a young man, I did have a problem with alcohol for a while. <laughs> what? You were a drunk, Grandpa? R Rosie, enough with the language, OK? Addiction is a disease, like diabetes or cancer. Would you make fun of someone with cancer? Wait, who wants young, Grandpa? <laughs> <laughs> As hard to believe as it seems. <laughs> yes, yes, I was once young. And yes, I did have a drinking problem. But it was before your mom was born. And I haven't had a drink since. 45 years sober. How you like me now? Hmm? <laughs> That's crazy. You have more willpower than anyone I know. Willpower has nothing to do with it. Everybody's got a weakness. Everybody. And alcohol was mine. Being an adult can be complicated, Cam. You know, sometimes people want to escape themselves, escape their lives. Being a teenager is complicated, too, but you would freak out if I had any pills or alcohol to cope. Yes, I would. You think your life is so complicated right now, but just wait until you have some real problems, little Missy. Yeah, great pep talk, Mom. I wonder what my weak spot will be when I grow up. Well, we all have them. It's just a, a matter of um, accepting that we do. 
and finding healthy ways to deal with them. And most of all, most importantly, asking for help when we know we can't. Good save, Dad. You ain't seen nothing yet. You understand now, Cam? I think I do. Adults are weird. <laughs> you nailed it, Cam. You nailed it. <laughs> hey, those burgers better not have sesame seeds on them. <laughs> So sorry I missed lunch. It's okay. You can heat that up, you know. I know. I just like it cold. <laughs> Sounds like I missed quite the conversation with Grandpa today. How did I never know that he, he was an alcoholic? It's okay. They can't hear you. Rosie's taking a shower and Cam went next door to play. I'm not sure I appreciate him telling the kids that. You know how Rosie is. The first time she gets caught drinking, she'll use that as an excuse. You seem awfully sure that's gonna happen. I thought you trusted her. I do trust her. Now. But you and I both know it's only a matter of time before she starts experimenting. Well, that matter of time better not start till like six years from now. Six years? God, that's scary. I know, right? It's gonna be gone in the blink of an eye. My idea about building a tower is sounding better and better, right? <laughs> this whole thing has me realizing I should clean out the medicine cabinets. You're such a good mom, babe. Wait, the medicine cabinet. Yeah, don't throw away the Propecia, because this stress, the kids, I'm going to be bald without it. You're cute either way. Thanks so much for joining us for another episode uh, of Awkward Conversations, episode two. We're here for the post chat. I am your host, Jody Sweeten, along with Amy McCarthy, who is a licensed clinical social worker, who will be with us helping to guide the conversations about how to best help your kids. A huge thank you to the Elks DAP, which is the largest all volunteer nationwide drug awareness program. And also a huge thanks to the DEA for their outreach program and for making this possible. Now, one of the things that we saw here in episode two that was being discussed was the use of uh, prescription painkillers, prescription meds, um, both by the adults and also, you know, cleaning out cabinets when it, when it comes to having those kids in your house. What are some of the things that you have seen and that you recognize that can be um, dangers when you have prescription meds in your house? Yeah, yeah, no, wonderful question. I think that... Um, for the families that I work with and talk with a lot, the things that are very helpful are to be aware of the fact that first and foremost, young people do sometimes use um, prescription medications and, and misuse them. And so being able to have those conversations with your children to make sure that they know about the, you know, the pitfalls or the potential hazards of that, I think is, is one thing. Another thing that I would recommend is to um, kind of keep tabs every now and again, like look in those medicine cabinets, you know, you don't take out the cough medicine until somebody has a cold. And if you're lucky, you know, then that's not very often. And so going through and kind of checking how many pills are kind of left in here. What was kind of the, the level that I last saw this bottle kind of at? Um, and in certain cases, if you're concerned about these types of things, uh, investing in uh, objects or, or kind of items like a lockbox so that you can be able to, you know, have those things be put away and know that they're safely, you know, contained so that your children have to come to you in order to, to get access to medications when they need them. I think prescription lock boxes are actually really, really important. You know, I have two daughters, 13 and 11. And while I trust them, they have friends in the house. They have, and you know, kids make impulsive decisions. 
even over the counter medications that you might keep in your medicine cabinet without really thinking about it. Um, those are things that kids will find. And, you know, I, I, I mean, I remember kids my age when I was young and it was like, well, if, you know, if two is good, six is better. Absolutely. Yeah. And also prescription medications that, that you're also taking or that another person in the family is taking. And, you know, um, kids may kind of get confused. They think one bottle's, you know, something when it's something else, or, or they may be looking to experiment with their, you know, siblings stimulant medication or something like that. And so, so again, being really mindful of kind of holding the reins and the control in your household around those things, I think is really critical. Absolutely. And, you know, there's also um, every uh, October and April, there's drug take back day. You can uh, actually use the resource below to check your zip code and find out places where you can take old medications, expired medications, medications that you don't use anymore. Um, You can take all of those things back and have them safely uh, destroyed because it's actually not a good idea to flush medication down your toilet um, or put it in in your water. It actually really affects our water. So don't do that. Um, (laughs) Hot tip, hot tip. Do not flush. (laughs) Now, one of the things, you know, we're discussing um, the use of pain medications and different influences in kids' lives. Uh, One of the things that actually got brought up in this video too was, you know, the daughter talking about her knee hurting Mm -hmm. uh, and that coach was pushing her to just keep going a little bit further. And, you know, these days kids get in competitive sports and they really push themselves. Kids do have so much pressure and are kind of pushed to to points that um, may put them in positions that, you know, experimenting or or using things to kind of help them, whether it be sports or, you know, their creative, you know, creative process for, you know, music making or for, you know, their art or whatever kind of it may be that interests them most. Um, And so while coaches and and kind of older adults and mentors can be such a, um, a positive impact on young people, we do want to kind of be mindful of, you know, as a parent and as a caregiver, what are your values and how did those values align with the kind of mentors in your child's life? Um, And remember that um, both your child and you have additional support, such as, you know, their pediatrician, such as the, you know, the school nurse, people who can give feedback based on kind of, you know, the medical science around what is okay for your child to do and what's not okay. The daughter, you know, she mentions this in the video. She says being a teen is complicated. And it is, there are all of these things going on to us as adults. We go, Oh, we've survived these things and we know that it's going to be okay. But you know, to young people, oftentimes this is the first experience they've ever had with a heartbreak, a rejection, uh, a loss, something like that. And for them, it, it, the flood of emotions is huge. So, you know, as parents, it, it's, there's this fine line, I think that we walk of being like, look, you're going to get through this while not discounting the importance of what that emotional moment is for them and how, how to help support them and grow through that emotionally. 100%. Absolutely. I am very excited to introduce our next guest, uh, Denora Walcott, who played Mary in our Awkward Conversations uh, videos. Hi, Denora. Welcome to the conversation. Hi, Jody. So happy to be here. Yeah, thank you so much. And you did such a great job uh, portraying a mom in a difficult situation. You know, I, I, thank you. I think we've all been there. You're a mom yourself. You have two kids, correct? Yes, yes. I have two kids, a seven-year-old and an almost two-year-old. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's, it, yes. it feels like it's a young age, but it comes quicker than you realize. Mine are 13 and 11 and it's even seven and two. It's hard to watch them go through this emotional stuff. It absolutely is. There, there are just so many levels to it that I don't know that I fully anticipated. You know, we've lived through some of our own awkwardness. And then all of a sudden there are these little people who are making discoveries all the time and asking questions that just kind of make me go, oh, right. Oh, we should talk about that, right? right. Oh, how do I talk about that with you? Yeah, because, you know, and I, I say this all the time, I think the conversations that we had as young people with our parents, that it, it's a very different conversation today. It's Absolutely. You know, no longer is it like, you know, you don't do this, you're going to become psychotic and you're going to have, you know, it, then the, the fear we've realized, I think, as parents that we have to have a much more open, nuanced, layered conversation in regards to drugs and alcohol, prescription medications, all Absolutely. of that stuff. Absolutely. Because, you know, we now know better. We know that um, kids are more complex than than what people at one point gave them credit for. Yeah. Um, we have a much deeper understanding as these little people 
than what anyone thought. You know, um, a lot of times I remember conversations being had around me, but not necessarily with me. And, you know, kids can pretend that they're not listening, but kids are always listening. Especially when you don't want them to be. They're always listening. Exactly. That's when it's the most interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And so, you know, learning how to have the conversations is, you know, it's really important for me. Right. Um, Well, I think, you know, the the conversation that happens um, with uh, your dad in, in this scene and him being honest and talking about you know, that he's got 45 years sober and he used to have a, a, a struggles with uh, alcohol addiction. Um, you know, it can be hard as someone who has been through recovery myself, whose story is very much out there. Um, it becomes hard to have that conversation with your kids because you suddenly feel like you're saying the, you know, do what I say, not what I did. Right. Uh, and, and there is a fear like, and there's a great line in there that you say, um, I believe to your husband's character about, you know, I don't want them to use it as an excuse. Right. I don't want them to think like, oh, well, because someone in my family had a, a problem, then there, then of course I'm going to, which is right. something I, I related to very deeply um, as, you know, sort of using that as an excuse. Um, how, I mean, what are some of the ways, Amy, that, that you can approach these conversations when you have someone in the family with some addiction issues? Yeah, this is something to be aware of. And as you talk, you know, to other people and your medical providers and your teams, and as you just think about the decisions that you're going to make for yourself, um, you know, having this be part of that conversation. When I work with parents on, you know, how to talk to their, their young people about this, thinking about their own substance use, whether it became something that, um, you know, crossed the line into, you know, disordered use or not, um, having them be able to think about that with another kind of trusted adult before they approach that with their children, I have seen to be so incredibly beneficial um, in terms of, you know, just being prepared around what you want to say. You're talking to your child about things that they maybe have never tried before in their first time. And this may be your first time kind of approaching this subject. And so it's okay to practice again and and reach out for your own support and model that um, for them as as they kind of figure these things out for themselves. The adage of it takes a village. Mm -hmm. I I have so many trusted uh, adults in my life. Uh, I guess I'm an adult now these days too. Uh, (laughs) I have so many other, you know, friends who I know are trusted adults in my children's lives um, that I know I can have these conversations with, you know, it's okay to like practice. I think as parents, often we think we're supposed to have all the answers and, and we don't in in a lot of these situations. And so we have to talk to people who have more experience or people like Amy who this is what they do and can guide parents through these conversations. Um, and now, Dinor, I know your kids are, are younger, but have you had to have any conversations with your seven-year-old yet about anything like this or any sorts of, you know, being careful about things in the medicine cabinet or anything like that that has sort of been a lead up to these more difficult conversations? So my seven-year-old now can open some child safety containers. Right. Like that was a, you know, she's now figured Once it out. And that, just, you're like, oh, it's all over. Right. <laughs> so that is about to be the next conversation and, you know, figuring out where things need to go. And <laughs> so we were talking about, you know, the age of kids and Denora said she has, uh, you know, seven and two. And I wanted to know what, what are sort of the appropriate ages to start having these conversations? I mean, I know you don't want to put fear and ideas into kids' heads before they're even there. But at the same time, I think we all know that these things come up a lot earlier sometimes than we expect. So Amy, what, what are some age appropriate conversations say for Denor's seven-year-old to have about, you know, medications and, and drugs and alcohol? You know, you want to take, take into account the developmental stage uh, of your child and also what are the, the type of lived experiences that they're having and um, know that there's no way that you're going to install something in their mind that's going to prompt them to probably use these things in a way that's going to harm them. Instead, again, as a theme here is going to empower them with knowledge and information. And so one really wonderful resource for, for all parents and caregivers is a website, getsmartaboutdrugs.com. And on that website, if you scroll down the page, you're going to find this great link for a guide on how parents can talk to their young people about substances of any kind. Um, and it's really going to break down from those you know, ages and stages of you know, when is maybe a helpful time to talk about what. 
Uh, Denora, you're mentioning that your seven-year-old is now able to open up those, uh, you know, those child-proof locks, which is like an accomplishment. Like you want to be so proud of your child, but you're also like, oh no, like, please, like, don't, don't. Um, but I think, you know, knowing that your child now is able to open up those medicine cabinets, it's a great time to start informing them about what are they going to find on the other side of that door? And, um, you know, what are the, the risks and the hazards that are associated and to set really clear expectations with them about how you, you want them to kind of interact with those medications, mostly probably not really touching them at all. Or we, we kind of referred to earlier that they should come to you if they need anything, or if they have questions about, about those things. So that's a couple of thoughts that I'd have about that. Fantastic. And I'm, and that's, you know, it's so hard because I, I think we all expect that maybe we have to wait till middle school to have these conversations, but really they need to start happening a lot sooner than that, because, you know, kids are exposed to things that like in the scene is, you know, when, when uh, David says to you, Denora, uh, you know, that better be roughly six years from now, um, you know, talking about age appropriate conversations and age appropriate, you know, uh, uh, use, I guess, of alcohol or drugs, you know, at 21, it's a different conversation. Um, right. And, you know, is it, Amy, is it feasible or, or even smart <laughs> to think that your kids are not going to do anything until they're 21? And, and you look, there are some kids out there that probably won't. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's the million dollar question. And I think it's really important to emphasize that, you know, these are discussions that I have, you know, each and every day, five days a week, you know, 40 plus hours a week. And, you know, they are so complicated and it is so challenging and it can be really, really overwhelming. And this, this question in, in general is one of those ones that, you know, it's really hard to tell your child, like, you shouldn't do something but if you do, then like, here's how you kind of should do it. Right. And so the, the way that I do a lot of the work with my families is to recommend to families that abstinence is, is a model of sharing with your children and that you should encourage abstinence. Um, what we know is that the least amount of times or exposures that your child has to substances before their brain is fully developed the much it, it's much less likely that they are to develop any type of challenges in using substances in the long term. And so, yes, we know that, um, you know, by the numbers and, and de developmentally, young people will experiment with substances. And I think that we want to prepare young people to say, we're not going to be happy if you're using substances. And, and one of those techniques or strategies I also advise is to say, if you do experiment with those things and you're open and you're honest and we have a conversation about it, the consequences will be less severe. Not meaning that there won't be consequences at all, but if you're being able to open up that door again to more conversation, kind of transactional conversation and prepare your child to figure out, well, what happens if this, if this happens next time? Or how did this feel? And for them to have outlets about these things that I think that's where you're really going to get the best, best case scenario for your child's future. Right. And like you said, Amy, I mean, you have these conversations 40 hours a week. This is, this is your job. This is what you do. I've worked in treatment. I've got experience in sobriety and I have a 13 year old and an 11 year old who I'm still like, this is so overwhelming. And I know that parents feel you, that, that there's no right answer. And, and maybe sometimes there isn't, you know, and maybe sometimes the, the, the best option, like you said, is really just making sure that those open lines of communication are there because that's, I think what is the most important thing, and again, getsmartaboutdrugs.com is a great resource that parents can go to to find ways to have those age-appropriate conversations and to not feel so overwhelmed by what is obviously, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a huge issue. I think, you know, Denora can, can agree as a parent, it's one of the things that, you, that terrifies you, as, you know, as your kids get older is like all of the uncomfortable conversations that you have to have, right? So many things that I, if I could just like kind of check a box, I'm like, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> I, I would check the boxes, you know, um, but I know those are the key conversations that need to be had. And I am trying to do my best to figure out how to have those conversations. You know, as long as I am doing, as long as I am trying, as long as I am trying to have the conversations and, and also being honest when I don't have the answer mm -hmm. and, you know, letting my daughter know, I don't know, I'm not going to pretend to be uh, an all knowing adult. Mm -hmm. When I really don't know something, I tell her, I don't know it. And I, I think that's helped her ask me more questions, 
you know, and sometimes I'll say, well, let's look it up together. Well, let's try to find out together. Or I'll say, you know what, I'm going to go find out and I'll let you know what I find out later. And it's, it's more fun that way because we're doing some of the learning and discovering together. Right. And I think it's also important for, for kids to understand, like, and I tell my kids this all the time, I'm not perfect. I don't have all the right. answers. I try. I try to do the best thing in the moment for you. Right. And, that's, and that's really what I expect as well. So just do your best in the moment. So Denora, you th- were such a great mom in this. I, I wanted to know if, you, you know, as you were working through these scenes and, and, and you know, interacting with, with these kids and, and the, you know, the, the faux husband, did any of this resonate with you as far as things that you're going to take into your own life with your own kids and experiences? And what was it, what was this like for you? What were some of your favorite moments of, of doing uh, these scenes? I absolutely loved working on this project. Um, the, the actors, the producers, I mean, I, I just, I loved everyone. You know, I, I, I'm trying to be friends with everyone that I worked with there because it was such a, a wonderful experience, but it also has truly informed uh, future conversations. Um, I spoke to my husband every day after, you know, recording and I would say, oh man, you know, I never thought about what that conversation is gonna be like. You know, I never really thought about, you know, what if it happens where they, the conversation happens at the dinner table and then what do we say and how do we connect and do we need signals? Um, it, it's, it's definitely made us think about um, substances in a way that we haven't where our children are concerned, um, which is wonderful. I am so grateful for that. I'm so grateful and um, I, I'm excited to be a part of it. Um, pretending to have kids who are much older was a little bit stressful because I could really, you know, I have a girl and a boy and my daughter's older than my son. So seeing these two kids was like, oh, this is, okay, this is future. Okay, we're going to be talking <laughs> right. about doing things like eating toothpaste as, as much as we are about um, drugs at school. Okay. Right. Um, and it's it's opened my eyes and it's actually made me feel more secure in, <clears throat> excuse me, in my ability to have these conversations. Um, it's made me more aware of certain things that might come up. And really, um, it's wonderful to know that, that it is awkward and it's supposed to be awkward. Um, and to have the opportunity to connect with other parents and let other parents know, yeah, this stuff is not fun. It's it's going to be messy. It's going to be kind of icky. Um, one of my favorite scenes was uh, connecting with David, the dad, in the mm-hmm. bedroom after that that first conversation, and just kind of being like, "What? What just happened? Right? Oh my God, is she going to be like us? Don't don't let her be like us." But then also, we weren't that bad, you know. It's it, it felt very genuine and very mm-hmm. honest. Um, and it felt like a conversation that my husband and I would have, like, what do we say now? Well, you were so amazing in this. And, and you did, like I said, you did such a great job at playing just Thank a, you. a real mom of like kids with life stuff. It's not, it's not easy. It's, you know, <laughs> it's not. complicated. So what's up next for you, Denora? What, what, where can we find you next? Well, I have actually, I've been making all natural and organic products for years for myself and for my family and friends. And my friends finally bullied me into, why don't you share this with more people than just yourself and us? And so I started Nora Made Goods, Nora Made Goods. Um, and you can find it at noramadegoods.com. I do all natural deodorants, all natural body butters that are wonderful for Ooh. eczema, um, uh, body oils. And uh, it's just all things that that I want to put on myself and my children. And so now I've decided to share. Oh, that's great. I love that. So uh, uh, what, what was the address again? Yes, what? Nora Made Goods. You Nora can find us on Goods. Instagram, right. online. Perfect. We're definitely going to check that out. Well, Denora, thank you so much for joining us for these awkward conversations today. You definitely made them a little less awkward. And uh, you did such a wonderful job portraying uh, the the mom of this, Mary, who is going through these awkward conversations with her kids. Um, So really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for your honesty. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. This has been wonderful. Absolutely. And remember, check out Nora Made Goods. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. You're going to love them. Absolutely. <laughs> and I will have to have you uh, as a guest on my podcast, which is called Never Thought I'd Say This, which is a fun, irreverent, inappropriate look at parenting. Oh, yeah. I would love to do it. It's in the books. It's happening. You just let me know. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Bye. 
All right, Amy, thank you so much for joining us uh, in this conversation on episode two of Awkward Conversations. Uh, you really brought up some great points about how to talk to your kids, um, and how to keep medicines and medications under control and safe and locked up. And you just had so many wonderful words of wisdom. I really appreciate it. Um, are there any last words that you'd like to share with our parents or any other resources that they might be able to find? Yeah, no, and thanks again for having me. It's been such a wonderful time to chat with you and Denora. Um, you know, I guess my my final thoughts for kind of this episode and for today are remember that uh, you can have a do-over as a parent too. And that um, as we kind of talked about in this conversation, there is no perfect way to have this conversation with your family or with your children. And so, you know, if you feel like you didn't kind of get it right the first time, it's okay to kind of go back the next day or, you know, the next week and own that with your kids and model for them that it's okay not to be perfect. And, you know, I've had some more thoughts about this and let's talk about those and, and see where they're at. And it also allows them to have some follow-up with you about any questions that they've had. Um, so, so yeah, remember it's okay not to be perfect and that, um, you know, keep looking for those supports uh, where you can where you can find them because it's hard. It's really right. hard. It is, it's really hard. And uh, anyway, thank you so much, Amy, for being here. We really appreciate all of your knowledge and uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you, likewise. All right.